This week's episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Listen each week for interviews with the world's most interesting people. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. It was so much about norms that had changed rather than laws where big businesses were suddenly given the green light to say, no, we don't owe anything to our employees as we used to. We don't have to offer them affordable health care. We don't have to give them fixed pensions like we did. This new right-leaning economic paradigm was suddenly the one that had replaced the New Deal. I call it the raw deal. Welcome to Future Hindsight, a civic engagement podcast. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Our guest is the legendary Kurt Anderson. We discuss his latest book, Evil Geniuses, The Unmaking of America, A Recent History. He looks under the hood of the movements that powered our continuous shift to the right, starting with a strong yearning for nostalgia that has led us to the extreme kind of capitalism that we see in the U.S. today. We start with who the evil geniuses are and what they're all about. I, I realized as I wrote this story and as I researched the story, there were individuals. It wasn't just a matter of forces and, and institutions, and it just happened. There were important characters along the way, somebody like Milton Friedman back in the 30s and 40s, and then finally in the 60s and 70s, who set up this idea that all that mattered <laughs> and all that ought to matter were profits, and that greed was good. I don't really include exactly Ronald Reagan among the evil geniuses, but sure, Ronald Reagan was one. Certainly today, Mitch McConnell is one. And they are both intellectuals of the libertarian far economic right. There are far right politicians. There are lobbyists. There are people like Charles Koch. Charles Koch is definitely one of my evil geniuses, this libertarian billionaire who started this political project that was really under the radar for decades, really, but then finally was successful in the 90s at beginning to really take over the Republican Party as the main vehicle, but not the only vehicle, of the evil geniuses. And their desire first in the early 70s to stop from being swept away by what they were afraid was a socialist revolution in America, that didn't happen. And then by the late 70s, they had built their institutions, these think tanks and lobbying firms and all the rest, and saw that, wait, we not only haven't been swept away, we can go further and we can take over and we can turn back the New Deal, which seemed like an impossibility just a few years ago. But then it didn't. And they kept going and they won. And here we are. Yeah, they kept going. You talked about Ronald Reagan. You don't really necessarily consider him an evil genius, but he was, in my mind, sort of the arbiter of nostalgia at the time and who was the perfect messenger for this new paradigm of greed is good and that corporations must first and foremost benefit the shareholders. What is the role of nostalgia in making this radical right shift palatable and almost under the radar, like you said? It was an organic thing coming off, as I tell the story anyway, in the late 60s, when everything had become so maniacally new, 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 for better, in my view, maybe as well as worse. But then it reached this kind of extreme moment in the 60s. So there was a kind of natural public reaction against that to some degree and like into nostalgia first for just, wow, what were things like back in our sweet, innocent time 10 years ago? before Kennedy was assassinated, before all this craziness of the 1960s happened, before the Vietnam War. What was that like? So there was first this nostalgia for the 50s and the early 60s. But then that quickly in, in the pop culture spread into a generalized nostalgia for the American past of the 40s and the 30s and the 20s. And my evil geniuses understood, wait a minute, we can use this 
nostalgia that's afoot for the charming, beautiful, wonderful, seductive past and politicize it and present Ronald Reagan and Republicanism as this lovely, wonderful return to small town, pleasant America. See, I'm falling into a Ronald Reagan voice before <laughs> it all went kerplooey here in the 1960s and 70s. So instead of saying, wait, we want to get rid of Social Security and get rid of uh, the New Deal and get rid of Medicare and, and make your life harder, they sold it as part of this return to America the way it was when we were living in nice small towns and we were cowboys. And and you know me, Ronald Reagan, who played cowboys and heroes and good guys. And he was a perfect candidate to do what they needed doing, to make this radical shift in the kind of American paradigm, get rid of the New Deal, but make it nice and sweet and kind looking and full of this Americana resonance. Yeah, I heard a radio interview this summer where the person said, yeah, Ronald Reagan just delivered every message with a smile. He just smiled a lot, but he said really cruel things. He had really cruel policies. Unlike Donald Trump, the Republican Party, by the time of Trump, had this other post-Reagan uh, viciousness and just crazy monomania about the things that Ronald Reagan had started. But also, obviously, Donald Trump didn't say everything with a smile or kindly, which is an interesting sort of bookend to what began with Ronald Reagan. So what are the key things that happened in the 80s, the epitome of the right turn for everyday workers? Well, there were so many. And the one that very few people were against at the time were these massive, radical income tax cuts. Taxes had already been cut from their heights of the 1950s and early 60s in America when things were going fine and we had really high income taxes on the rich. And then in 1981, they were cut in half for well-to-do people and cut somewhat for everyone else. But the whole point, as the Reagan Knights said, this is really all about cutting taxes dramatically for rich people and big business. But the other big thing that they did in 1981 as well was they began crushing organized labor. They went into high gear in, in fighting unions and being anti-union. And Ronald Reagan did it in his first six months in office by firing all of the unionized air traffic controllers who had gone out on strike and said, no, you're federal workers, you can't go on strike. They said, we're going out on strike. And the next day I fired them. And of course, ironically, they were one of the two big unions who had just a few months earlier endorsed him for the presidency, it was this amazing signal to big business to say, there's a new boss in town and a new set of norms in town and not new laws, but just a new norm about unions. And if your workers go on strike and uh, then you settle the strike, you don't have to hire them back. That had always been legally so since the New Deal for you know more than 40 years, but it wasn't done. That would be too vicious. That wouldn't be fair. As the 80s rolled out after this air traffic controller strike that Reagan busted, they did it again and again and again. And, and by the end of that decade, what had already been a decline in union membership accelerated. And workers began saying, wow, unions don't do anything for me. And instead of suddenly saying, well, I'm going to vote against Republicans because this Reagan administration has crushed my union movement, they became Reagan Democrats. You know, they voted for Ronald Reagan and that, that changed our politics and really reduced uh, worker power in general across the board. It was so much about norms that had changed rather than laws where Big businesses were suddenly given the green light to say, no, we don't owe anything to our employees as we used to. We don't have to offer them affordable health care. We don't have to give them fixed pensions like we did. This new right-leaning economic paradigm was suddenly the one that had replaced the New Deal. I call it the raw deal. Reagan didn't run on this, he ran on this, oh, no, life will be better, morning in America. It was hard to run against. And of course, their idea was, the supply side idea of, of economics was, 
We radically cut taxes on rich people and big business, and they will work so hard and be so profitable that they'll create jobs for everybody, and it's a win-win, and everybody will be okay. And what happened was, it was a win for the well-to-do in big business, and has been ever since, whose incomes and wealth have increased, as everybody's used to. But the other 80% of America, it's been flatlined ever since. Those are the two big changes that happened in the 80s. There are hundreds of smaller changes that became gigantic changes, like suddenly in the 80s, the federal government saying, okay, big companies, you can buy back your stock. You can use your profits to buy shares of your stock to make the price of the stock go up. That used to be essentially illegal. And suddenly in 1982, it wasn't. So they started doing that. And then there's a hundred things like that that served in so many different ways to fortify and increase the power of, and the wealth of the wealthy and big business that, that were done in small and large ways starting in the 80s. And until really the last decade or so, that basic new paradigm that was imposed economically hasn't been challenged in this country. Democrats became sort of the liberal Republicans because there were no more liberal Republicans. Democrats had to play them in, in terms of economics. <laughs> and that's what happened. So why do Democrats embrace neoliberalism and help some of these evil geniuses rig the economy for the rich? Like, how did that come about? Well, it came about when certain liberals, certain wonky college-educated liberals started calling themselves neoliberals. It wasn't a pejorative. It was like, you know, we're neoliberals. We're new liberals. Gary Hart was one of them. Most of the leading Democratic U.S. senators that then ran for president were neoliberals. They were Democrats. They were liberals. But they decided, nah, unions are not who we are necessarily. And they said the New Deal is not what we are necessarily. We're not about regulation. We're not about minimum wage. We're not about overtime pay. We're not about all those old, fusty 1930s things. We're new in this new computer age. And so there was a certain amount of naive earnestness about going to the center and compromising. Of course, our new president became a U.S. senator in 1972, just as this was starting, right? To compromise with the Republicans and the right. So it began that way. And a lot of leading Democrats and certainly the elite by by nature of being elite, were affluent. They were doing okay in the new system, in the new paradigm in the 80s and 90s. Like, yeah, I know these. it's too bad about these manufacturing workers no longer having jobs on that, but yeah, I'm doing okay. They didn't say that, but that fed the neoliberal idea. One of the phrases that became this common phrase you started hearing in, in the 80s especially is, I'm fiscally conservative, but socially liberal, which meant... <laughs> Don't do anything to take any of my wealth away because I'm affluent. But if you want to be gay, if you want to smoke weed, if you want to do what, you know, oh, of course, women should have equality. All those things that cost me no money. Sure, I'm with it. I'm down with it. Civil rights, that too. Yes, absolutely. And the general left state intervention in markets idea came to seem old and obsolete. And that encouraged this neoliberal idea among Democrats in America that like, yeah, we're all free marketers now. There really can't be a critique of maximum libertarian economics because that's just silly. That, that really came to be the default idea in America and, and of course, led to all kinds of uh, bad results, including white working class voters in America saying there's these two parties, there's really not that much difference between them on economics, but there are differences on these cultural issues. The Republican Party kind of hates the same people I do, so I'm going with them. And that's obviously a simplification, but I think that is the story that happened in terms of how this giant economic change has affected politics ever since. Well, one of the things that really struck me is that you said offshoring jobs ended about 10 years ago, and now we're just doing robots and AI all over the world. It makes a lot of sense that in the last 10 years, people have now finally spoken up about antitrust issues and labor issues and the fact that the minimum wage has been frozen for a decade, which is essentially a 30% pay cut and health insurance and all of these things that people kind of 
didn't understand were really happening. And now they're finally changing the conversation. Maybe we'll have some change after the pandemic, especially. I do think so. I finished this book when Donald Trump might have been reelected. This book came out in August when the idea that Joe Biden was going to become president was still an iffy proposition. And I was trying to be hopeful, you know, and I am hopeful right now because I do think Joe Biden and the people around him understand that there has been a change, exactly the change you're talking about, which is to say that a decade ago, uh, this hadn't crystallized and coalesced in that many people's minds, the rigged economy. Then you had both the Occupy Wall Street people on the left and the Donald Trumpists and Donald Trump himself on the right starting to talk about the very same thing, the rigged economy that Wall Street has robbed you and, and destroyed jobs and factories and livelihoods and all the rest. It began to crystallize and seep into the general appreciation that something is wrong here. Of course, different people have different ways of explaining it. And in the case of the Republican Party, they actually don't want you to think about that, even though Donald Trump, when he ran the first time, part of his pitch was essentially a Bernie Sanders pitch about how Wall Street and big corporations have screwed you. The fact that Donald Trump successfully ran on that as part of his 2016 platform, really, is evidence of what you're talking about, that, wait a minute, this isn't right. This is just unfair. And part of my own journey to research and write this book was to really try to nail down what happened, why, when, what. My goal was to try to say it was in this way, as opposed to all the ways it was worse back in the day, it was better. Not that we're going to go back to 1976 in every respect, but that in my lifetime and the lifetime of many Americans, it was dramatically hijacked for the benefit of the right and the rich. By looking at that closely, it's just evidence that it used to be different. Why was it changed? Oh, this is why things are so bad for most people now. Rather than just sort of accept it as a given, which, of course, the people in power want you to do. This is just the way it is. Sorry, you're not as rich as I am, but, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That was Kurt Anderson, author of Evil Geniuses. When we come back, we'll discuss how the permanent fund in Alaska is a powerful example of an effective and popular social program. Are you looking for more interviews to dive into, hoping to get career or life advice from someone at the top of their game, or maybe you just want to know what it's like to live inside the space station or to be undercover for the CIA? If you said yes to any of those, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show. Each week, Jordan sits down with guests who run the gamut, from successful to inspiring to fascinating and beyond. Jordan's show was named one of Apple's best in 2018, and it's easy to see why. His deft interview style and slate of fantastic guests make for great listening, no matter where you are or who he's speaking to. I really enjoy this show and think you will as well. There's just so much here. Check out jordanharbinger.com slash start for some episode recommendations or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. What I like the most about your book is that there are so many possible answers that can help us get out of this. You know, it took us 40 years to get here. Hopefully it will not take us 40 years to get out. You write about how Norway and Denmark and Finland have done this and how Alaska has done this amazing thing. Can you talk to us about what Alaska accomplished and why it worked so well? And also how funnily the person who made that happen was a libertarian. I had known about this thing that Alaska has done for many years, which is to send a significant size check to every citizen, every man, woman, and child in Alaska every year. That is a percentage of the wealth that they have gotten from oil companies for the drilling that has gone on for the last 50 years in the North Slope of Alaska. So they find oil. This most conservative, most Republican, libertarian, pioneer state 
right? Alaska. They hadn't been a state for very long when this happened. And uh, this one professor who had come up from the lower 48 and was an economics professor at the University of Alaska, who was both, as he called himself, an anarchist and a socialist. And somebody asked him, what should we do with all these billions of dollars the state's suddenly going to have from the oil companies? And he said, well, the only way it's going to do any good is some of it goes directly to the people. Well, uh, that took off. And the Republican governor said, yep, I agree with that. And they passed this thing called the Permanent Fund of Alaska, which put this fraction of all the billions of dollars of oil royalties that Alaska got and still gets into this fund. And then, as I say, divided it up absolutely equally. Children get as much as adults. Every adult gets as much as every other adult. So there, it is this little universal basic income and not that little. Some years it has been as high as $4,000 or more a person, which if you have a family of four, that's 16000 right there. So it's a lot of money. These days, as Republicans call any modestly, you know, capital D Democratic social program, socialist, it's socialist. Here is this Republican state that had this absolutely socialist expropriating oil wealth and giving it to everybody program that, by the way, former Governor Sarah Palin increased the amount that they would take from the oil companies and increased the size of these annual payments. It really goes to the, this question of the stupid, pointless quality of so much of this quote unquote debate. Well, that's socialism. We hate socialism. When here, my God, in Alaska, it really is. And yet, do the Republicans and the good libertarian people of Alaska hate it? Are they rejecting it? Are they getting rid of it? No way. The Alaska thing and the, and the story of how it happened, it just shows you that if you take away your pre-existing pigeonholes, and binaries of, you know, free market or socialist. Well, that's stupid. Every free market so-called society in the world also has social democracy. Among the freest of the free market economies, the ones you mentioned, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, also have these huge social welfare states. It's not one or the other. In their case, it's both. Yeah, I think that's a great takeaway. And also, since you mentioned the American Rescue Plan. What do you think is the most promising part? And do you think that in this moment, this inflection point, as you would call it, whether it will succeed to change our trajectory? Fingers crossed. When the election went the right way, I thought, okay, it's not happy days are here again, but we are not falling into the abyss. The, the, this American Rescue Plan says several things to me. My hope for it is that it, along with it, a much more effective rollout of the vaccine and dealing with the pandemic, has to have the effect over the next year of convincing Americans that this thing they've been saying since Ronald Reagan and before that government doesn't solve the problem. The federal government is your enemy. The federal government is not the solution to the problem. The federal government is the problem. All that thing that has just been buzzing in Americans' brains for almost a half century, they'll say, like, wait a minute, no, that we needed the federal government to deal with the pandemic, to keep the economy afloat, and now they're also giving me money? This doesn't seem so bad. So I think it will have a big effect, I hope, on de-demonizing the power of good government, government that helps people, and also re-establishing uh, the idea that, no, this country should be more fair economically. Then the pandemic comes along and like, oh my God, things are terrible, crazy. Let's do anything we can to keep everything afloat and save as many people as we can and spend trillions of dollars to keep everything going. Well, th those things together are this inflection point, are this crisis moment, not unlike 1933, 32, and, and when the New Deal came along in the United States, saying, wow, this is a radical time. We need radical solutions. And then you have Joe Biden, the most unradical seeming human being <laughs> practically <laughs> imaginable, or kind of generic Democrat uh, doing these things. It's funny to me and wonderful that he is doing these things that if an Elizabeth Warren or a President Sanders had done, it would be much easier to caricature for the right and Republicans as, look at this socialism. It's Joe Biden. It's Joe Biden just being his <laughs> nice guy self, which is a great trick as it turns out. So I am hopeful that it will be a pivot point. For instance, on this 
this child credit thing and this $300 per kid per month, which is a lot of money if you don't earn much and you have kids, it's only for this next year. I think it's the kind of thing that people are going, wow, that was pretty great in 2021. Why did the Republicans take it away from me in 2022? Once you start doing them, this sense of more equity, more equality, economically, more fairness, once you start doing them, there's a kind of ratcheting effect where it's hard to pull back once you've ratcheted forward, right? I sketched out at the end of Evil Geniuses the reasons this moment could turn out okay if the cards went right and if Trump and the Republicans were defeated. Well, they were, but this, I got to say, I wouldn't have predicted that it would have gone so well and so close to my if you will, prescriptions in the last chapter of my book, as it has, you know, two months in. It's totally remarkable. I agree on your comments about if it had been a President Warren or a President Sanders, it would have been received very differently. So I'm going to ask the classic conservative rebuttal about the American Rescue Plan is like, how are we going to pay for it? But actually, you have some really great ideas in your book. For example, you talk about antitrust. And you talk about the U.S. government behaving like investors. In fact, they underwrite so many innovations in the U.S. and they could actually make money there. So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, there, there are all kinds of ways we can pay for it. For instance, you mentioned that all of the work that the federal government has done to create innovation, make new companies, build companies, Certainly, especially in the scientific realms, in, in biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, Tesla, all of these wonderful technological innovative companies that make somebody like Elon Musk into a mega multi-billionaire depend on technology that at a very early stage, the federal government in the National Institute of Health or DARPA or all these different ways that the government invests in early technologies has made possible. And yet, the government has this reputation as being the government. They're just in the way of entrepreneurs. They don't help the economy. They just do regulation. What? I mean, almost every kind of great pharmaceutical innovation, and as I say, all these technological ones, various parts of the digital revolution, have their roots in federal early investments. But we don't think of it as early investment. We just think, oh, something the government did. Who cares? Oh, no, it's Steve Jobs. It's Elon Musk. They did it. If private investors had invested such that we, the American people, in the form of our government, had invested to make Tesla possible, they'd be getting money. We don't. The internet itself, an invention, essentially, of the Department of Defense 50-odd years ago, if private investors had invented the internet, I think they'd be getting a lot of money from it. Now, we, the people, the United States government, are not. So those are just examples. And then there's other ways of thinking about just the things we own together. Like Alaska decided that Alaskans really own this oil that you oil companies want to drill, so we'll sell it to you. Well, what else do we own? Well, we own the air rights over America. So don't we? So if you company want to put more carbon into the atmosphere, well, pay us Americans who own those air rights for that. And so on and so on. And there is a sensible way of thinking about the stuff that we own in common. And of course, it's a balance. You know, you, you want entrepreneurialism. You don't want the heavy hand of government on everything. But as I say, we went to this extreme version of a kind of capitalism, unlike really any in any other rich country in the world. We became the outlier. People talk about American exceptionalism. We became exceptional in this different way, in not providing universal health care, not providing very much of a social safety net, all these ways in which we became different. And maybe now we will become a little less different. I, you know, talk to me in five years and we'll see how it went. But I feel, knock wood, pretty hopeful. In this moment, we're still in the pandemic, technically. It's not over. And also knowing that AI is only going to become more ubiquitous. I love your analogy, by the way, of horses that could not be retrained to do another job. So humans, very many of us, will 
B, potentially jobless forever. As we think about this, what are two things that we could be doing as everyday citizens to demand a fair society here in the U.S.? I think instead of just as political citizens, we have to have a template for looking at this. One way of doing that is reading this book. There are other ways of doing that, but not just waiting for each election. We can't just do this every four years or even every two years of just, oh, okay, we get excited for a couple of months and we vote for this person rather than this person. It has to be a more steady as she goes, constant thing of like working for the candidates who really believe this stuff. And again, I, I have a big tent. AOC is great. It doesn't have to be just AOC. It doesn't have to be just Bernie Sanders. There's not one way to skin this cat and you'll skin the cat in different ways in Colorado or Nebraska and you will in Queens, New York. The Alaska thing, I think, is a great case study of how talk about things without the pre-existing labels. I don't mind that if people want to call themselves socialists, fine. In most places in America, it's not a way to get elected to things or convince people of things unless they're already convinced. I think it is a matter of how you talk about basic fairness and really spend time talking about lived experience. People say, think globally, and they mean various things by that. I think one thing that ought to mean for Americans is to look at all of these other countries. As I've said, almost every other rich country in the world, they all have universal health care in a way that everybody can have and afford, and we don't. And that goes for so many things that are just standard almost everywhere else in the rich world. They aren't here. Now, why is that? Well, we can't afford it. Yes, we can. Didn't you just tell me that we're the richest country on earth? Well, why can't we afford it? There are so many things in this public policy realm, in this social fairness realm and economic fairness realm that are done so much better than we do elsewhere. So things that seem to so many Americans who aren't aware of this, like pipe dreams, it's working fine in Finland or in Canada or wherever you look. Once you look at the facts of health, longevity, fairness, all the various kinds of rage Americans feel about things. It doesn't have to be this bad at all, and we can fix it, you know? Here, here. All right, here's my last question, and you've answered this in part. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? I mean, I don't want to depend on demographic destiny, but... I think on the racism side of the coin, which isn't the subject of my book, I think while the fact that the American population has gotten significantly less white in the last 30 years is, of course, a big reason that these kind of spasms of bigotry and racism are now occurring. But I guess I'm hopeful that that will decrease with time, as the newness of our multiracial, multi-ethnic America ceases to be new and continues to be more and more the fact of life. I am hopeful that nobody 40 and under has lived in anything but this unfair, obviously unequal, economically immobile country that we live in. We'll see, this isn't fair, let's make it fairer. I am hopeful that to some degree, people my age dying off and, and people my race dying off, I'm hopeful about the effects of those, frankly. There are legit historians and political scientists who believe in cycles of various kinds. And some say the cycles of history are 15 years long or 30 years long, going from left to right or more economically fair to more more free marketing. Having studied and researched and written Evil Geniuses, I really do have a sense, not 100% conviction because it's not like a law of physics, but that we are at the end of an old cycle and the beginning of a new cycle. That from around 1930 to around 1980, you know, the beginning of the New Deal to the beginning of <laughs> Reaganism, the Evil Geniuses, the Raw Deal, call it what you will, that was a 50-year cycle. And we're now at the end of this 50-year cycle, and they always overlap, right? I mean, the 70s was kind of the overlap decade between the the New Deal era and the new era. And I think we're in that overlap era now. It could all go in the toilet. But I do think 
that for many reasons, both intuitive and empirical, we're at the beginning of a new cycle. I, I hope I'm right about that hunch. I hope you are too. Thank you so much for being on Future Hindsight. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, it was a great pleasure to talk to you and thank you so much. No doubt, this has been a hopeful conversation, not only because, like Kurt, I believe that we are about to embark in a new, fairer chapter in American life, but also because I'm reminded that we as private individuals have the power to shape that future. The evil geniuses we talk about build a coalition of people who believe in the same ideas and shared a common vision and were willing to act upon them together. We can do that too. In fact, we ought to. This episode is full of good ideas that could benefit our society. And our world is full of successful examples from Norway to Alaska. Our future is in our hands. If you want to better understand how we find ourselves in our current economic and political reality, and you're only going to read one book, look no further. In addition to giving you all the information you'll ever need, this is a fast-paced, exciting page-turner. Next week, our guest is Sarah Kenzior, the author of Hiding in Plain Sight, The Invention of Donald Trump and the Erosion of America. We take a deep dive into how the former president was decades in the making, starting with the steady weakening of democratic norms during the Reagan administration. Trump is not a political neophyte in any way. He was mentored by Roy Cohn, who is both a GOP operative and the lawyer for the five crime families of New York City. And before that, of course, he was uh, Joe McCarthy's lawyer. He helped create McCarthyism, and he was one of Nixon's advisors and then one of Reagan's advisors. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for continuing to listen to Future Hindsight. Our executive producer is Mila Atmos. The audio producer is Peter Fedak. And our associate producers are Miriam Zumbul and Brooke Sion. Be sure to listen to us on Apple Podcasts, futurehindsight.com, or wherever you enjoy podcasts every week. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.